Okay, comments. First, uh, uh, a little bit of a warning, I suppose, rather than a, an apology. This is going to be quite bitty and uh, quite quotey. Um, I was uh, hoping over the last uh, 24 hours or so to uh, get a little bit of time to edit it up a bit more, but uh, I spent uh, an inordinate amount of time looking, gazing into the inner workings of the toilet and, uh, and wrapping a red flag around a new man, which uh, in a different context could be judged as quite a nice weekend, but uh, uh, not, not especially, uh, not especially as it turned out. Obviously, the, the, the title of this session, i.e. Bourgeois Elections, Instrument of Deception or, uh, or Liberation, um, the first thing that pops into mind, uh, given what our organisation has been through over the last uh, 10, 15 years plus, really, is the experience of the uh, ex-Labour Party left, the, uh, the so-called revolutionary left, uh, and its engagement with the electoral tactics since the mid-90s uh, or so. Now, I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on, but uh, just in that sense to summarise uh, what I'm going to actually uh, uh, say about it, uh, is that clearly that engagement has ended in a ragged uh, retreat, a retreat in disarray. Um, the, uh, the common sense appears to be, outside of a few organisations uh, that, uh, that still do engage in a very uh, low level, in my view, and in a very dispirited manner, is that there is, quote unquote, no space for a, a left, to build a left alternative to uh, uh, the Labour Party. Um, which I think is uh, something that uh, we, would, uh, we would contest. Uh, it also depends on what your definition of uh, the left is. Uh, and in their own way, uh, I think we can actually say that what the left has done, what the ostensibly revolutionary left has done over the past period of its engagement with, uh, with elections, with uh, the electoral tactic, has helped ensure that the bourgeois elections, the field of uh, electoral contest, has remained an area, uh, an instrument of, of deception. It has not actually started to uh, create a different type of culture, a different type of orientation uh, for it, a Marxist one. I think that places, quite frankly, a question mark, once again, about the nature of their Marxism, whether they're Marxists at all. So, in the answer to the question, uh, I do hate sessions that start with questions like this because it's, it's all a bit SWP in my view. You know, um, yeah. can the unions ever fight again? Question. Um, the answer, however, is is clearly that the category of bourgeois elections uh, contains within itself both possibilities. Uh, what decides that? What decides whether they're an instrument of deception or an instrument for liberation? Uh, not the instrument. Uh, is a question of struggle, uh, the degree of organisation, weight and hegemony of the militant, socialistic, communistic proletariat in, uh, in any given society. So the left argument, or an argument that poses left, that somehow <coughs> elections are irrelevant now, and I've seen people uh, actually cite positively levels of abstention in the not too uh, distant past, as evidence that, uh, that uh, the left should, really shouldn't be engaged in uh, electoral contests as they're increasingly irrele irrelevant. Or the ultra-left, more theorised ultra-left argument that, okay, social democracy, official Marxism, engaging with, in electoral tactics was quite correct at uh, one stage. Yes, we all agree with uh, uh, Engels' optimism in particular. I'll be quoting him a little bit later. But now, really, in the period of capitalist decadence, that tactic is more or less uh, ruled out. Uh, Lenin's argument against the ultra-left, I think, is, uh, is still very precise in terms of those arguments, i.e. that an institution uh, or a body of political thought can actually be obsolete from the point of view of world history, but still lingers on, still has potency in, in uh, contemporary society. So you say parliamentary, the parliament, bourgeois elections, the bourgeoisie are obsolete from the point of view, in that sense, of, of uh, human history. They're still here. Uh, Stalinism is obsolete from the point of view of history. Uh, not simply does it linger on in some of the wackier sects on the fringes of the, of the workers' movement. Again, I would uh, argue that it reinvents itself. It reappears in different forms in different sections of the radical left. Uh, so it clearly has, still has a, some degree of life, some degree of potency 
even though you would have anticipated if you thought about it in formal terms, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the experience of real living socialism would have, uh, would have killed it. So Parliament as a forum then for the fight for the liberation of the, the, the working class, that's really what we're talking about and it, I think it does have the potential still to uh, be that. I know it's not an exact analogy because we are talking about bourgeois elections in, uh, in that sense, uh, under a bourgeois society, etc. But the, there is a parallel, I think, with trade unions. I mean, how, do you, how do most trade unions present themselves in, in, in today's uh, world, in today's Britain? Um, I think highly bureaucratized for the most part, um, defined by passivity of members, uh, defined by lack of democracy, uh, a paucity of vision. Um, a, uh, 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 until recently, I think, declining membership, uh, dominated culturally, politically, in terms of quote unquote program by a, uh, a mediating non working class caste that, uh, that so sells uh, the particular commodity labour power for the best price that it can get and uh, gains its. Uh, gains its particular privileges from that, i.e. the bureaucracy. Okay, that's a trade union. Does it have the potential to be uh, what Marx and Engels, I think particularly Engels, uh, talked about, uh, about a trade union uh, becoming as well, i.e. a school for communism? Well, I think it, trade unions do have that potential. It relies on the question of struggle and uh, the question of, uh, of again, program in, uh, in that sense. So. As an instrument of uh, liberation, obviously elections have, I mean it's commonplace I think amongst us and commonplace on the left to say they have a, a level of usefulness which is below you know, the, the question of liberation as well. Uh, I mean Engels mentions uh, uh, an election accurately informs us concerning our own strength and that of all hostile parties and thereby provides us with a measure of proportion for our action second to none, safeguarding us from untimely timidity uh, as much as from untimely foolhardiness, i.e. if they won't vote for you very likely, un unlikely to go to the barricades to make the revolution alongside you, uh, uh, which is quite correct. Um, and you could say, in that sense, part of the reason for the retreat of the, the left of this uh, period uh, is not simply the fact that it, in political terms, the left illustrates when it does engage in elections, <coughs> when uh, uh, when it has attempted to engage over the, the, the past period, that politically that it doesn't know its ass from its elbow. All right? Not simply that, its attempts to, to, to create shortcuts to political influence have all ended in uh, disaster. So it's no, no surprise on that level that they have retreated from the uh, electoral tactic precisely because it accurately informs us concerning our own strength in contemporary society and as beautifully illustrated. Social way. Uh, yeah, social way. <laughs> Absolutely social way, my ass. Um, as illustrated by the last general election, the left precisely has no social weight. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it may not lack influence in other spheres, may not lack influence in other spheres, but uh, its, its retreat, retreat was also precipitated by the fact it doesn't want to look at, look at itself in the mirror. It doesn't want to know the truth about, its, uh, about itself. Okay, so it gives us uh, it gives us a uh, a measure of our uh, strength. And I think Trotsky Trotsky talked about it also in terms of a snapshot, <coughs> contrasting it in that sense to uh, a moving piece of film. A snapshot does tend you know, does tell a truth, but something you see something in motion, it tells more of a uh, more of a truth. But uh, can, as I say, can it be more than that? And uh, myself, uh, along along with the. Uh, the towering authority of Engels uh, will uh, will argue yes, and I'll quote him explicitly saying so uh, later. Uh, also, before we uh, sort of get into more of the meat of this question, that uh, it is worthwhile thinking about elections and ranking them really in terms of the work of uh, a revolutionary organisation. Uh, it is a secondary question in that sense, not an, not not unimportant, very important, but elections clearly are not the motor of. Uh, motor of history, class struggle is that. Le elections can reflect that class struggle, can take a snapshot of that class struggle, um, <coughs> and it can give us a, a measure of the effect that our propaganda is having at a particular time, the mood of a class, undoubtedly. But it is a, a secondary uh, question. 
how to make it more than simply that uh, snapshot is this uh, is uh, something uh, that uh, that really forms the core of what we uh, should be thinking about uh, in this session and outside the session as well. I.e., an election is also, uh, from uh, uh, from our point of view, an opportunity to pursue one of the fronts in that class struggle, and a, and a very important front in the struggle. I.e., the ideological one, the one of uh, the one of uh, politics. Yes, there's a question of agitation around particular issues, but also there's a, there presents an opportunity to make uh, broad propaganda for the ideas of communism, for the vision of communism. I think uh, communist parliamentarians, revolutionary parliamentarians have made brilliant use of, of uh, parliament for both uh, purposes uh, historically. And I suppose going on from that, talking about the vision of communism and uh, the methods to get to it leads us really, I suppose, to the, the nub of the question, is that our attitude to bourgeois elections and our, the process by which we can imagine in <coughs> turning them from deception into an instrument for liberation, and that, at the nub of it is our attitude to the nature of the class itself, the nature of its revolution, and the nature of the type of society, the type of uh, uh, post-capitalist society that we um, are aiming for. And just to supplement what I said before, I would uh, <coughs> therefore argue that judging by the tone, the contents, the direction of <coughs> the less recent interventions and ongoing interventions in the form of task, maybe, yes, that's carrying on, isn't it? Um, and whatever other Frankenstein monsters may, you know, rear up to scare us in the future. Uh, the less attitude to that, the question of the class and its revolution is, if we're being generous, we, we could say pre-Marxian, but uh, uh, as I've indicated, uh, I think it's most certainly non-Marxist in, uh, in the modern sense. On the question then of, uh, of democracy more, uh, more generally and, uh, and bourgeois democracy per se, I hope people get uh, from this week yeah, they've got already, even though we're fairly early into it, a clearer notion of the project of uh, the CPGB. And that is, and it, an absolutely essential pillar of it, is to establish the centrality of the struggle for democracy to the Marxist project. That has a reflection in how we view organizations on the left. It, uh, it, has a, it finds a reflection in how we view the attitude to uh, democracy in our movement, uh, to, the recallability of officials, the uh, recallability of MPs, the pay we give to trade union officials, etc. But also in the broader sense of the word, it, it, it forms the core of what the revolution in that sense is about, i.e. that uh, it is, in the words of Communist Manifesto, uh, the winning of, for the battle of, uh, the winning of the battle for democracy, led by the working class as the working class is the only consistent democratic uh, class in today's society. Right. So we have this category, this rather odd, lumpy category of bourgeois democracy. Okay. So uh, what, what do we mean by bourgeois democracy then? What, uh, if we're talking about the, the, the question of the working class and its relationship to democracy, what does bourgeois democracy uh, look like? What's its, what's its nature? Um, we, a number of our comrades, uh, I think John, etc., have, have said, in that sense, that it, it is a it is an awkward and, in some ways, misleading uh, category. The standard attitude you get uh, from left-wing comrades. I mean, when challenged, they very often they'll deny it and say, "Oh, the the, the bourgeoisie has nothing to do with democracy, or whatever." But it's almost implicit. It's implied in a great deal of the assumptions they make about slogans, about politics, uh, about the, uh, the the approach to uh, the approach to the question of uh, revolution. Is that with the operation, this assumption, you know, as I say, you, you, it's a unspoken but uh, underlays a great deal of what uh, common say. With the operation of the law of value, almost with uh, with bourgeois social uh, relations, you would anticipate that in a normally functioning capitalist society, they would automatically evolve almost a level of democracy. That the law of value, left to operate in, a, in an unfettered type of way, somehow gives us freedom of the press, 
universal suffrage, including women, uh, a parliamentary form of some uh, some sort, uh, you know, uh, but, but naturally with that uh, with that type of society, uh, this uh, this right, almost the invisible hand of of uh, the market also, you know. One hand does uh, general good through the market, and the other creates these institutions. Okay, I capitalism uh, <coughs> is related to democracy in some way. Um, the approach that we've tried to emphasize in the CPGB over a number of years is that the, the capitalist class has nothing intrinsically democratic about it as a class. It has nothing intrinsic to <coughs> the way it operates in society, the way it uh, functions as a class that requires broad democracy. Pluralism may be another, uh, another question, the ability to, to uh, actually argue about certain courses for society, the economy, etc., without having your head cut off and all your property taken away from you. That's a different question. But the notion of popular sovereignty, uh, the, uh, the idea of general suffrage, the, the, the capitalist class has no particular need for uh, for that. And so the category of bourgeois democracy, if we're going to keep it, and I think, I think we should in that sense, uh, actually needs a different type of context. Uh, I, it's usefully thought of as the level of democracy that the popular classes, uh, the working class in particular, has been able to win, to wrest from the hands of the, the bourgeoisie through struggle. And that this level of demo democracy, cramped though it is, is constantly uh, contested by capital, it's, uh, circumscribed, reined in, hollowed out, uh, etc. It's a result of struggle from below, either as a direct, uh, uh, um, a direct answer, a direct uh, retreat in the face of a, uh, a militant challenge, or in the collective memory of the bourgeoisie, remembering that militant challenge, a sort of preemptive sop uh, to, uh, to those below. Um, so, okay, bourgeois society, uh, that that's, tends to be the, the way that we uh, speak about this, uh, this thing. I won't dwell too long on, in, in terms of uh, examples, but I mean, the, as we're talking about elections, the mother of all parliaments is quite a good, um, uh, it's quite a good one. Um, <laughs> There's a, there's a high level of cynicism about the operation of, uh, of Parliament, and uh, on, although we don't endorse cynicism as a political response, it's understandable. But nevertheless, people still go to the, to the polls, they still have illusions in the Tweedledum, Tweedledee process of, uh, of electing new, uh, new parties. Um, in its origins, uh, and in its functioning for, for a great deal of, uh, great deal of time, uh, clearly, the, the impulse to create it was nothing to do with democracy. There's a good quote from, uh, which is in one of the books we don't have here, uh, in the enemy camp. Plenty of them. Though. We don't. Actually. <coughs> Those are my loft. <laughs> okay. They're, they're, if comments are interested, they're kind of insulating John's loft, mm -hmm. but, uh, despite about, despite shoving them up there, it's actually a good book. Uh, there's a quote in that from uh, Lord Balfour, a Tory uh, prime minister, and. Uh, you know, indicates a certain degree of cynicism from the ruling class about, uh, uh, about the operation of Parliament, let alone the masses. Uh, he says, our alternating cabinets, though belonging to different parties, have never differed about the foundations of society. And it is evident that our whole political machinery presupposes a people so fundamentally at one that they can safely afford to bicker, and so sure of their own moderation that they are not dangerously disturbed by the never-ending din of political conflict. Uh -huh. So, you know, there's an example of the, of, of the democratic content as far as a, a leading Tory is concerned of, uh, of, of, uh, the, of Parliament. Ah, yeah, it's a place to sound off, to talk within particular parameters about the, the direction of capitalist society, <coughs> but nobody fundamentally disagrees. There's no fundamental challenge there. It's, uh, it's, um, um, it's a safe place. And obviously, the, you know, going back a little bit further, quite a bit further, the, I mean, the origins of Parliament in, uh, in feudalism is essentially about the conflict between what was called later the divine right of kings and uh, the uh, baron's right of resistance, i.e. creating a space where, uh, you know, certain degrees, certain degrees of self-limitation could be imposed on the king, 
through a rebellion, or, uh, or through a boycott of certain uh, uh, taxes, etc. And uh, the nobles could have greater access, in that sense, to uh, the, what were misnamed their ancient freedoms, and in effect meant, you know, greater access to the, uh, uh, the surplus of, of the, the produced by the, the uh, dominated uh, peasantry. So, and despite that, despite the fact that it had a narrow basis in the property classes, clearly that there was nothing about, uh, uh, there was no fundamental challenge to the system. Uh, it was extremely limited in its remit, in what it could do and what it couldn't do. Um, and criticism was tolerated in exchange for the ability to raise taxes, in that, uh, uh, in that sense. Uh, so, uh, to, so in its origins, in its later development, etc., and as it stands now, Parliament had nothing to do in that sense with a democratic impulse coming from above, a democratic in, uh, impulse coming from uh, the ruling elites. Ruling elites in general, I think it's part of, to, to reiterate a, a point I, I made earlier, ruling elites in general, I think, do find it useful to have a, fo a forum, a series, where different approaches to, uh, to the problems that confront the society that they dominate can be sounded off about, can be sifted through and, uh, uh, and discussed to a, to, a, to a certain degree. But that is not democracy, as I said, that's a degree of, of uh, pluralism in that, in, that type of, uh, uh, in that type of sense. It's uh, nothing about rule from below, our, our understanding of it. Clearly, there's a complicating factor in Parliament uh, uh, as it presents itself to us uh, today in the modern world with the rise of the working class the, uh, and the parties of, uh, of the working class. And again, this illustrates our point in that sense. Um, if the Chartists, the first working class party uh, that, uh, uh, as Marx and Engels uh, defined them, if the party had won its struggle for universal suffrage, uh, if it had won the vote from below using its means, then the character of democracy in Britain would have been stamped with something very different. Uh, the character of democracy in uh, Britain would have had more of the, the feel of those below. It would have been far more, far more reaching. It, it could have gone far beyond that and had uh, revolutionary implications uh, revolutionary implications. The fact that the Chartists lost and then a restricted uh, uh, franchise was later granted as a SOP obviously starts to mould the type of democracy that we, we have, uh, sets its parameters, underlines its cramped uh, and uh, scooped out type of, uh, type of nature. Um, however, the working class does have a vote. There is a working class presence in, in uh, not simply as, a, as wage slaves in society, but in the political process. The fact that the Labour Party, when it was uh, created, however a, a pale a reflection of the working class in political terms, it existed. Um, it's, it's having a Labour Party, having a Labour Party represented in government, Having a Labour Party on occasion forming, forming a Labour Party sorry, represented in Parliament, having on occasion the Labour Party forming governments is not the best case scenario for the ruling class. They would much prefer that, uh, in essence, the, 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 the working class is presented between the choice of bourgeois, uh, uh, explicitly, totally bourgeois parties a la, uh, uh, a la America. It's not the best case scenario that Labour even has a partial independence in political terms in that, uh, that type of way. Okay, we'll move on to some comments and ideas directly associated with Marx and Engels and the question of, uh, mostly Engels, uh, question of elections. I've already mentioned that essentially from the beginnings, more or less from the beginnings of the, the organized workers' movement, the struggle for universal, normally male, uh, suffrage was a key, uh, key goal. Um, and Marx and Engels' close relationship, working relationship with the Chartists indicate the importance that they attached uh, to uh, organisational stroke political representations of those type of struggles and to the fact that, that suffrage for them was also a very uh, important demand. Now, 
Uh, there's a, I have a quote about um, Mark, from Marx here in the Hague Conference of the First International in 1870 talking about the possibility on places like Britain of the working class maybe achieving its aims uh, peacefully in contrast to uh, most of the continents, he says. Now, and that would seem to me to imply at least some sort of notion of an unstoppable force in society, organised, making radical encroachments on the ability of capital, capital to rule in society as it was constituted then, even though it was, might not be able to, to, to go for revolution at any particular time. And, and it strikes me that obvious that that would have some sort of electoral expression as well, that uh, the majority class would form its parties and they would, uh, they would be represented in... Uh, representative institutions even under bourgeois, uh, bourgeois society and be heavily represented. Um, more interesting in uh, that sense and uh, di relating directly I suppose to the, uh, the question posed in the, the title of the talk was Engels' comments in his introduction to Marx's class struggles in France. Uh, he wrote the comments in uh, the edition of 1895 and obviously his analysis of uh, 1848 revolutions, etc. And I'll try to uh, I'll try to be pithy in terms of the quotes because I don't want to bore comments too much. But it's worthwhile saying that um, uh, I mean the comments that Engels makes here have been used by right wingers in the movement, uh, Euro communists in particular. Uh, I recall uh, to uh, sort of present Engels in his dotage as really a rather toothless sort of formist, really sort of gave up on those revolutionary notions of his youth and came around to sensible electoral politics. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll quote more fully than they ever used to do to, uh, to illustrate the, that is uh, a lie one amongst many. Okay, uh, so Engel says, look, when we come to look at this analysis of 1848, all right, proceed, uh, the, 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 the subsequent history has told us a few things, he says. You know, we, hope, we would hope to be cleverer than when we were there, he said. It's taught us, uh, well, it's not merely dispelled the erroneous notions we then held, it has also completely transformed the conditions under which the proletariat has to fight. And key to these erroneous uh, positions, he said, uh, that have been overcome, is, quote, that the time of surprise attacks of revolutions carried out by small conscious minorities at the head of unconscious masses has gone forever. And in stark contrast, he adds, quote, where it is a question of the complete transformation of the social organization, the masses themselves must also be in on it, must themselves already have grasped what is at stake, what they are going for, body and soul, i.e., end quote. That is, a, a mass communist consciousness. That, that is what uh, seems to me obvious Engels is talking about there, that the, 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 the class enters the path of revolution, uh, which is uh, not a revolution just as one moment, uh, but, a, but a process that can cover uh, an extended period. It starts down the path of that in a conscious type of way. It knows what it's aiming for, it's already grasped at what is at stake, and they're going for it, uh, body and soul. Mass communist consciousness. I, I was reminded uh, when I was rereading this uh, about an exchange I had uh, recently with a, uh, a veteran Trotskyist comrade who I go for the occasional beer with, and he tries to recruit me. Um, get a free beer out. Get a free beer out. I get it. No, no, I, I buy my own. I buy my own. He's no, he's no day's pension. I don't sponge your people. Thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, and he, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's very assiduous in trying to. Uh, recruit me, sends me, uh, sends me letters quite, uh, quite frequently with cuttings and this sort of thing. And I wrote something in the weekly work uh, recently, just bad mouthing the rest of the left, as, as is our want, um, and uh, criticised the, uh, the, the, the way that these ostensibly Marxist groups choose almost any type of politics apart from Marxism to present to the working class, i.e. I said, you know, an attempt to trick the working class into revolution, and the working class has to make a revolution consciously, otherwise it's not really a revolution. Right? Uh, and, and the comrade actually did write back to me and said, we are quite wrong, we do try to trick the working class. <laughs> I'll, I, I, it would be unfair of me not to add, he did put single inverted commas around it, but I think the single inverted commas stood for the transitional method in that sense. <laughs> Transitional method. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, counterpoised to that, it seems to be Engels' notion of mass uh, consciousness. I'll go on uh, with Engels because he's good old Engels. Um, 
the means in, in the political situation, the political landscape that he is surveying, the means he sees in front of him to win that type of consciousness is, quote, long, persistent work is required. And it's just this work that we are now pursuing. And it, in two forms in particular, he highlights slow propaganda work and parliamentary activity. Clearly, you know, what this preface is uh, relating to uh, is German, the rise of German social democracy. And he says, given, uh, given their success in, in contesting bourgeois elections, elections under the conditions of bourgeois society, uh, they've given their comrades in all countries. I mean, this is saying this is a universal tactic. Now, this, this has been illustrated in Germany with particular uh, sharpness, with, with particular brilliance. But it is a tactic for all countries. Uh, a new weapon and one of the sharpest, i.e., the, the, the right to vote, uh, the, the right to take part in bourgeois elections, to stand candidates, to, uh, to for the working class to, to cast its vote, has become, in the words of the French Marxist Party, Engels observed, quote, transformed from a means of deception, which it was before, into a means of emancipation. And I, I, I would, I know it's quotey, 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 but um, I, I would like to do this because. His, his clear joy at the discomfort of the ruling classes as it watches the rise of, uh, of uh, the votes of social democracy. I, I, just, I just do enjoy it. The irony of world history turns everything upside down. Who is this, Mark? Sorry, Engels. Oh, right. I've set them on Engels. Okay. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Engels in the, same, uh, in the same preface. The irony of world history turns everything upside down. We, the revolutionists, the overthrowers, we are thriving far better on legal methods than the illegal methods and overthrow. The parties of order, as they call themselves, are perishing under the legal conditions created by themselves. They cry despairingly, legality is the death of us, whereas we, under this legality, get firm muscles, rosy cheeks, and look like life eternal. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have a Welsh accent. Uh, Rhetorical flushes, uh, flourishes bring that out to me. Um, yeah, so I think that, that is an interesting uh, uh, preface, interesting set of uh, uh, um, arguments. And uh, as I said, confidence shines out from the, the words of, uh, of, of Engels there. Um, it, it's important that this comes with a certain health warning because very often, as I said, the political forces have used that uh, uh, preface in a particular type of way to bolster essentially reformist projects of one sort or another. Uh, he did not there rule out barricades, street fighting, force, violent revolution. He does not do that. Uh, in fact, his comments complain about the weekly worker uh, editorial team occasionally chopping lumps off and putting other bits in, but Engels' complaint against the editors of the SPD newspaper I think was rather more substantial in that sense. He, uh, he wrote a, a, a very angry letter to Korsky saying uh, that the editing up of my, uh, my article has made me look like a peace-loving worshipper of legality at all price, and I ain't. Um, so, um, yeah, so drawing from that, again, um, let me reiterate, the central points that allow electoral activity to become a means of emancipation uh, that Engels is talking about here in the sense that he's talking about. It's an act the notion of revolution is an act of a conscious, uh, of, of, a, of a conscious minority at the head of an unconscious mass, mass that is historically redundant. All right? So Tony Cliff's idea in the early 90s, on one of the mammoth sort of uh, minus demonstrations against Pitt, Hesseltine announced her pit uh, closures, that uh, this, we had this big demo started on Hyde Park. Um, it marched somewhere else in the, in the, in the manner of demonstrations. It went from A to B. And uh, Tony Cliff said, if only, uh, if only, I mean, this was 100,000 more, 200,000, something like that. I mean, yeah, yeah, so it was a big demonstration. He said, well, if only the SWP had 30,000 members, 25,000 members, we could have diverted the flow of the march, gone to Parliament, if we'd surrounded Parliament with those protesters on that issue, Parliament, you know, the government would have collapsed, Parliament would be more, more or less gone. I'm kind of thinking, what the fuck happens then? You know, even if that, even that fantasy was, was true, what happens there? But, I mean, it, it's, it's it, I, the, the, the SWP diverts the march and simply use the combustible raw material of ang people angry about pit closures to collapse the government in. What takes over? Government of the working class or government of Tony Cliff, God help us? 
Um, it, it's a, it, the working class is perceived there at, you know, as, as a, uh, uh, like a stick of dynamite to be deployed in the right sort of weak position on a, on a bridge you want to sabotage or whatever. It explodes as a blind force, uh, a blind destructive force, and uh, the revolutionaries are there to you know, build a new bridge or pick up the pieces. All right, the analogy breaks down. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah? Okay. Second point that Engels uh, says to came to reiterate, it's a mass communist consciousness and the working class must be clear about its final aim. Um, and that's why, in that sense, I think, you know, relating to discussions later on the week, that, that this revolution that we're talking about here is, uh, is the, in that sense, the second human uh, revolution. Because not simply is it, is it opens the pathway, opens the, the, the world of conscious regulation of uh, humanity's life and its metabolic relationship with nature, the revolution itself is a sort of explosion into areas of life, uh, into processes which pre previously presented themselves as uh, almost forces of nature, blind, alienated forces that acted on humanity. That the relationships between human beings present themselves as the relationship between things and the things that we conjure up through our work, through our labor, they come back to oppress us. Well, well the revolution sort of explodes those rarefied uh, um, alienated categories apart, um, and, and not to be the revolution as one particular act, but the whole process of uh, of the revolution in that uh, in that sense. So, uh, the revolution in, in that uh, way, we won't make the revolution like bees make hives. We won't make the revolution like um, ants make nests. Um, Moshe's point about ants' organization, etc. So it's not a conscious form of organization. They don't have democratic forms, as you, as you said. Although I was, I did say to Mike and was tempted to heckle constituent assembly. But I, I, I'm glad I didn't, actually. Uh, I, the analogy that Marx uses about human consciousness in general, that, uh, that, that as opposed to the beauty that we find in nature in terms of construction, etc., an architect, even a bad one, will envisage the end product in her or his head before starting to draw the blueprints let alone before the first, you know, um, first bit of earth is turned to build uh, the thing that existed in that person's, as a construct in that person's imagination. And third point that Engels draws out is, uh, an important means by no stretch of the imagination, the only, um, and no stretch of the imagination, uh, and other things ruled out, that it must go along uh, uh, this path, uh, and only this path, is the question of pa patient propaganda of communism, which I think is always uh, something we should uh, do, and utilizing uh, parliament, uh, i.e. it becomes an, an instrument, not the instrument, but an instrument of, uh, um, of liberation. Shouldn't you be telling me 10 minutes? 15, 15. thank you. Um, all right, uh, as I said, you know, you, I'm, I'm, Engels lords the success of German social democracy, gloats over the rise uh, uh, of numbers of votes, etc. And clearly he's looking forward to, uh, I, I know he, he uses analogy, uh, certain analogies which, uh, which give it, almost it's an irresistible force of nature, your state's the case to a certain extent. However, he does have the qualification that only a, a war can really uh, divert this great movement. So it's, a, it's also an anticipation in that, uh, in that sense. So Engels, very, very pleased about the divorce, very happy about the divorce. So on that level, does, uh, does this make Engels a sort of anticipation of John Rees and his question, his, the way he framed the, the search for votes via respect of making a difference, um, that uh, it wasn't about what the people who gathered together in a particular room uh, thought in their heads, it was really about gathering the electoral identification of the people out there, what they thought. Uh, matter. Uh, if you remember that period, the, 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 um, have, having at one stage been an organisation which, uh, which said that uh, engagement in the electoral process, standing in bourgeois elections, inevitably makes you a, uh, uh, an opportunist. All right? it, there's a process that goes on there. That's, it's just natural. So we abstain. Of course, we always vote Labour when it comes to it, we vote, you know, but, but we build a fighting socialist alternative. Having taken the road of contesting ele uh, elections, then you know these people flip over and precisely become the thing, the bogeyman. They try to scare us uh, all within the first place. 
but they uh, they most certainly had a went wholehearted into uh, the uh, into bourgeois elections. And if comes remember, I mean that was the time, as I said, they were talking about making a difference, not just making propaganda. Uh, Socialist Worker Party members would uh, tell you. Sorry. Uh, well, the respective venture. Yeah. yeah. Um, adventure? <laughs> Misadventure. Uh, I, I, the, Chris Banbury was telling branch organisers around the place forget dingy church halls and def forget horrible meeting rooms above pubs, etc. That's where the rest of the left might continue to meet. You know, get, is there a gallery somewhere? An art gallery? Meet there. You know, let's get a bit ambitious. It, this is true. It's true. Uh, it's pathetic, really. Um, we indicated that they became uh, actually. Uh, electoralists in the bourgeois sense of the word. All right? They were prepared to put principles on hold to the extent they actually were, they had any real, as opposed to formal adherence to principle, put those on hold in order to gather in votes. So, as it is, there an affinity there, given that you know, the Engels does gloat and, and it's, it swells with pride about the, uh, the, 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 the gathering of votes uh, by German social democracy. Obviously not. Because there's this question of purpose. And what was the purpose of those votes, that electoral activity for Engels? Again, a quote. The political institutions in which the, the dominion of the bourgeoisie is incorporated offer a fulcrum whereby the proletariat can work for the overthrow of these very political institutions. All right? We stand to see them fall, in other words. All right? We will utilize work in uh, the... the, the, the uh, area of uh, bourgeois elections, we will uh, we will we will make communist Marxist proletari uh, pr uh, proletarian parliamentarian par parliamentarians, but we understand we are in the enemy camp. Uh, we are conducting uh, 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 political struggle uh, in, a, in a an arena that is at the moment still defined for us by our political enemies, and actually we are using this as the way to throw overthrow their society, not to be incorporated by it, not to uh, prop it up in any tough way, uh, but it has a fundamentally different political, uh, political purpose. Um, and obviously the contrast to what uh, respect uh, and most of, well, all of the other electoral interventions of the left of the uh, past period uh, has done uh, could not be starker, I would, uh, I would suggest. Um, yeah, so with everything I've said there, uh, it's still too much. To, still too much in terms of notes, but I'll try to condense here. That means do flow from ends. If you have the ends of mass communist consciousness, the working class itself making the revolution, the working class ruling post the revolution in a in a way as a sophisticated political class. Right? If you have that ends, then it defines and. Uh, what means are appropriate to you and what means are not uh, uh, appropriate to you. And I, I don't, don't want to go on about particular history, sordid history of uh, the left in that sense, but I'll just list them out over the past 15 years. Trade union, was it trade unionist and socialist coalition? Yeah? Is that how it goes? Not trade union, trade unionist. Yeah. Tusk. Tusk. I, I'm sorry, I, I'm old enough to uh, think of the Fleetwood Mac album when somebody says Tusk. Uh, <laughs> The Socialist Alliance, right? the Campaign for a New Workers' Party, the United Left, Skaga Socialist Labour Party, etc., etc. Um, all embody the form of politics which, if you take the Marxist left at its word, as a Marxist left, embodied a form of politics as fraud. Right? I'll mention that very, uh, very briefly uh, later. Given the failure of the left to actually uh, encroach with a different type of appro uh, approach, a different type of culture into the arena of bourgeois elections, etc., what, what we can say as well is that, uh, uh, that elections now uh, overwhelmingly are bourgeois fraudulent. They are not a means of liberation of the, of the working class. And the sad fact, as I've indicated, that the left, in its own micro way, have actually uh, added to that uh, whole process. I just want to finish on a few comments. Uh, five minutes, yeah. Mike has written on this and spoken, uh, spoken in a very good meeting in the London Commons Forum we had with Moshe on the question of democracy, spoken on these sorts of areas. And so I just want to just, just to ram home the point, as it were, uh, uh, take three of, the, three of the ways that he describes 
bourgeois elections as a means of deception uh, agree with him, but also indicate that what the left has done is actually buy into that whole process and oh, <laughs> buy into that, not simply buy into that process, but as I said, added its own small contribution to in maintaining uh, bourgeois elections as that, um, uh, as that, uh, that type of uh, fraud, mass fraud. Okay, first, Mike says, well, you have uh, fraud in six systematically fraudulent misrepresentations, i.e., the recession is all the fault of this government. When we get into government, it'll be totally different. We will no more new taxes. Um, a, a whole series of empty promises which are reneged on very quickly uh, as soon as the new administration is, uh, is formed. Now, if you take fraud in the, in the sense of how the left uh, approached its electoral tactics, again, I'll come, I think respect is a, is a very good example. Uh, but also, also socialist parties, various inter interventions uh, as well. The, the one that I found particularly distasteful was uh, the question of immigration controls, because I, I cannot count the number of times in socialist alliance forums, in, uh, in respect, uh, we've had members of the Socialist Workers' Party and, uh, and the Socialist Party tell us, well, of course, the, the, I mean, the Socialist Workers' Party, you know, I tend to be left, more lefty in the, uh, in the Socialist Alliance on times, but nevertheless it was something that cropped up in, uh, from both organisations. Of course we believe in no immigration controls. We believe in that. Right? Of course that's a principle. That's a principle that's absolutely inviolate for us. We will not take one step backwards on that, but we shouldn't have it on this leaflet. Because this leaflet we're actually going to give to the working class. So, and the working class don't believe in you know, no immigration controls. The working class has got this prejudice and that prejudice. And, you know, so therefore, we have to lie by omission, or actually, the, an interesting process that, uh, that goes on, I saw with some Socialist Worker Party members as well, you know, a, a creeping sort of uh, metamorphosis of them. Um, ben spoke about in relation to the British National Party, that if you pretend to be something for long enough, you know, you can become it. You can, you can become it. Right? Uh, I mean, there, there are limits, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, tend to be a small flowering pot plant, but uh, I, want to, <laughs> but, uh, I want to eventually become it. Uh, in, in the sphere of human uh, activity and politics, in particular. All right? So, British National Party members in suits and ties going out and saying, "We don't do violence. We don't do street thuggery. We're a reasonable party. We're on the right wing, but we're not Nazis. We're not fascists." There's a process that by which, both collectively and individually, that organisation begins to change. I saw the Socialist Workers Party members. All right, when they would start to present arguments, not simply based on, "Well, of course, I believe in the principle, but this is a tactic," but saying, "Well." When I was on the doorstep, they said that blah blah had happened in terms of a, uh, a new mosque had opened there, and there was no consultation with the local people about the mosque, and then they closed down that youth club, and that was mainly used by white youth or Asian youth, or etc. Et but there was a slow process of the chipping away of even the formal edifice of principal politics that Socialist Worker Party uh, comrades and others, uh, others would, would, uh, would have, i.e. That, that systematic presentation of fraudulent, uh, uh, fraudulent uh, face to the electorate, it's not simply as uh, runs counter to our notion of what a revolution is, what, uh, what working class power actually is, it also has a material effect on the person who's conducting the fraud. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, two other points uh, I'll send, send quickly actually, that Mike mentions in terms of the, the ability to, for elections to be fraudulent is the restriction of the information available to the mark, the person who's being uh, um, frauded, uh, and uh, also the, uh, the, the, um, the domination of the process and the domination of the apparatus and the uh, subordinate to the interests of professional politicians, the epitome of which is Blair, someone who is a, a career politician, really, and the type of politics that he espouses is a secondary matter uh, to him. I think Mike mentioned the his, his university time when um, things were bubbling in terms of student politics and Blair just did not take part. He, he was not an engaged politician in that type of way. He's a machine man in that sense. Now, if you think about that question, the restriction of the information, well, uh, read the press of the left, read his 
it's uh, it, the way it presents arguments and reports about what is happening in the workers' movement. If you take the socialist, um, not simply have I been told by Hannah Sell, who, uh, who has been thoroughly ruined uh, by the Socialist Party culture, I have to say, when I first met her on the poll tax march down from Glasgow many, many years ago. I mean, she was a bright, engaged person looking for genuine socialist ideas, something that's quite uh, firm about principle, uh, etc. I think her current incarnation is, uh, is, is very sad in, uh, in lots of ways. I was told by her one time that, well, the way the socialist, uh, the, the newspaper, the socialist is, and the, the type of reports we have in it, we frame them so we don't confuse the workers. Right? There are too many ideas. I, if we say, well, there's a conflicted political question here, here's this side of the argument and that side of the argument, and this is what we, the majority in our organisation, thinks, but we have minority views, and etc. Workers just get bored and pick up the sun or know, turn on the TV, etc. I, that is, uh, that speaks to me of a, of a means indicating a different end. I, not that they want the working class to be a conscious uh, controller of the, the, the life processes of a society run by them, but indicates a bureaucratic control over the working class and a restriction of the amount of information we let the poor dears have for fear of confusing them. Simon Wells wants to come. I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> And the, the question of the subordination of uh, political parties and political perspectives to the interests of, uh, of um, um, career politicians, machine uh, politicians, etc. Again, I mean, I mentioned Blair, but I, how the uh, uh, turn the fuck off. Um, uh, the, uh, think about uh, Galloway in respect, and how uh, again principles we were told: women's right to choose abortion, uh, etc. The an NP on a worker's wage. Uh, were subordinated to his interests as an individual career politician, uh, or think about Crow and the, uh, um, the way the Socialist Party defers to him on, uh, on principle. So, I mean, very briefly then, the, um, uh, uh, that's all fairly depressing, uh, so sorry about that. Uh, what we need to do as an organisation in the here and now, I mean, I've tried to paint the big picture of what uh, what Engels talked about in terms of the transformation of the, 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 the tactic of contesting elections into a means of uh, emancipation. Uh, obviously a very different period and we're not faced with, uh, we're, not, we're not presented unfortunately with a uh, confident, vibrant, mass Marxist organisation garnering you know, huge numbers of proletarian votes and, uh, and a sense of, of going forward. We're in a situation of uh, retreat, a situation which is dominated by sects and sectarianism, weakened sects and sectarianism, but they still dominate. Um, and we, as a small propaganda group, uh, really, in terms of what's marking us out, the type of ideas we hold in our uh, head, uh, etc., although relatively influential for the size of the organization, uh, relatively influential in the sense that we punch above, way above our weight, we are still peripheral to the main debates and the main initiatives on the left. There's no, no question of that. Um, I think it's, as I've tried to indicate in terms of contrasting angles with, uh, uh, with um, people like um, uh, Socialist Workers' Party and the, the, S, the SP, I think the key question for us is the adherence to principle and fighting for what is what we have identified as the core of the Mar Marxist project and should lie at the core of the Marxist program, i.e. that the act of the revolution is the result of a conscious mass that uh, to be a politically sophisticated uh, uh, entity, the working class needs access to arguments and disagreements, dis disagreements and nuances of opinion within its own institutions, within uh, the political parties of the working class. There must be a thoroughgoing transparency and democracy from top to bottom in every institution of the, of the class, trade unions, political parties, etc. And to continue the fight for the, the ostensibly Marxist left, if it is a Marxist left, 
to orientate itself to principled unity in a single organization based on those Marxist principles. For those Marxist principles to find a reflection in a, in a program and then an orientation to the working class as the political ruling class of tomorrow. And I don't simply mean by that, you know, let's carry on what we're doing now. Uh, uh, well, I do. Um, ca let's carry on doing what we're doing now, but do it better, um, uh, I personally would say. Right? But uh, there, is a, there is a certain confidence that we can have that at a certain point, reality does impose itself, even on the most pig-headed of sect <laughs> leaders. I mean, I mean, here's a tip for you. If you're ever going to conduct a fraud, make sure as much of it is true as possible. All right? <laughs> Seriously, that's a good fraud. All right? You know, try to sell a, go you know, a gullible American, you know, Westminster Bridge. Don't try and sell him or her the bridge over the river Styx. All right? It, it, it has to have truth in it for people to believe in it. Now, bourgeois elections have a truth, right? Uh, people participate. There's, uh, you, you, you get to vote. Uh, you have a, a choice of party. Uh, you can't vote for us because uh, we, we can't stand the CPGB. You can vote for the Weekly Worker. Not that anybody did that. Uh, you can vote for the CPB. You can vote for the Tory Party, etc. And sometimes elections goes the, go the way that possibly sections of the ruling elite do not want them to go. They're awkward, uh, etc. The, but so there's an aspect of truth to it. That's not the question of the fraud, though. And to say, well, because that happens. Uh, there isn't a, a huge element of fraud in them, in them and their very nature. I think it's wrong. Um, and there was a funny second point and last point. Funny slippage between comrades, you know, on, in terms of this question of parliament and imposing parliament on other countries and uh, etc. And this somehow being a commitment to democracy per se. Because I mean, Moshe described parliament as a very useful safety valve. All right, and absolutely that that in societies. You do want to rule if you're a ruling elite with at least passivity and, and ideally cons consent. And uh, having a safety valve, pseudo-democratic institution of some sort, uh, which, uh, which uh, allows people to let off steam without fundamentally challenging the basis of that society, the way the society runs and who runs it, I would have thought is extremely useful if you can get away with it. So. Um, Commons almost seem, seem to be saying, well, because the, the, in various parts of the world, not exclusively, not, not universally, um, imperialist governments have, set, have attempted to set up parliamentary style forms, that therefore this is somehow a commitment to democracy. It's a, it might be a commitment to bourgeois democracy, but what I would try to indicate is that bourgeois democracy hasn't got the same <coughs> content that we're talking about. Uh, ours is a genuine democracy. It's allied with the struggles of the popular classes and the working class in particular. And theirs is a form of um, uh, scooped out, empty, shell-like uh, democracy. Yeah, but and there's a little, if, you, if you do the fraud, I want to cut as well, uh, because it's a good piece of advice. Just one point, I'll come back on Yas uh, Yasmin's, uh, Yasmin's point, where it, it did seem to me that uh, you're precisely taking from what I said about the, uh, the importance of electoral contest, about the possibility and the perspective of winning significant representation, as uh, Ted was talking about in, and the, you know, in bourgeois parliaments and via the uh, a, uh, electoral system still dominated by, uh, uh, by the, uh, or, or still, uh, the parameters of which are still set by bourgeois society, etc., being successful as a working class party there, then you, you appear to be assuming from that, which again, I think is part of this slippage that both you and Moshe were, uh, were coming, that, that I, I assume a passive electorate, sort of, uh, and that's, that's the way they express their uh, socialist communist convictions, i.e. a sort of uh, a, a platonic attitude to communism in the future, and I'll just go out and vote for my rep. Uh, that wasn't the expense of German social democracy. Um, what we're talking about, it, in fact, is, is precisely the, the, the votes that we get swelling with the struggle in that sense, and uh, what I like to call the sort of radical encroachments of working class rule, uh, working class influence and hegemony under this society, all right? that, uh, that we're influential in the army, in the economy, in the arts, etc. Uh, and as a reflection of that and as a way to drive it forward also, a reciprocal relationship, uh, we've got communist MPs and communist councillors and, and mass representation as well. Sorry? 
a long way to go. Yes. I, I anticipate next couple of years. <laughs> <laughs>